This afternoon's session is uh, processing the multi-beam data. My name is Mike Comback, and I've been um, at this for quite a few years, and I see some good friends from the past who've also been at this for quite a few years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so the multi-beam processing is primarily in our uh, MBMAC 64 program. And it's a, it's a really big program, and probably to uh, give training uh, that would really give a familiarization with it and a, a good grasp of the concepts is probably two or three days. And this is going to kind of cram that into an hour and a half. So the idea is uh, instead of trying to present everything and you know just go by at warp speed, I'm going to try and present some of the more important things and maybe do it at a, a more leisurely pace that, you know, that we can all feel comfortable with. And the last thing I want to do is, is have people leave the room uh, more confused than when they came in. So that, that would be a lose for me if, if that's happening. So we just start out. Okay, so an introduction to the program. Uh, this, this is about, oh, I guess it came out around 2011. Our, our idea was, uh, you know, an easy to use interface, uh, multi-beam editing and QC tests. Of course, it provides the tide and sound speed corrections, uh, manual and automatic data cleaning, uh, patch and performance testing, cube and cloud, so you can see how this is, you know, kind of growing and growing, and there's a lot going on in the program. Uh, the 64-bit technology is a, a step forward from uh, what we were using 10 years ago, and that allows you to load much larger data sets than in the past. Okay, so just uh, most of this is going to be actually running the program. I, there's, like, I think 94 slides here, so uh, that's, that's way too much, of course. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to try and live demo with the program. But this is what it looks like, and to run it, you can you just go off the high pack shell menu, uh, high sweep editor, or use the icon. It's pretty straightforward. And we'll go back to high pack. And, okay, uh, I want to load the project. On the thumb drives that everyone received as, as part of the uh, registration, there's a number of sample uh, projects. And uh, I think there's a install installation for the sample projects. Uh, you can use that, or you can probably just you know copy them onto your, uh, onto your computer. But what I'm going to try and do for the presentation is use the data from the thumb drive from the sample projects. And then if you want to, you know, try and uh, do it yourself when you get back to the office or whatever, then, you know, at least you'll have the projects. So, it's going to go to the HiPAC project manager, and we've got uh, sample editing and MBMAX. So, I'll bring that one up. And then up here is the... Uh, the button you push, High Sweep Editor 64-bit. You just click on that. And this is the program. So we'll just load some files in. We'll go to the raw data folder, our HSX catalog, and we'll select all the files. Now that's that's one way of loading the files, and there there is another way that it's really convenient, and I don't know if if, uh, if, uh, if it's widely known, but I'll just show you that real quick. So we're just going to cancel off of this. And if I go back to high pack, and then I click on this little Windows Explorer, and I go to the raw data folder, and then here's the catalog that we were loading before. Let's move this out of the way a little bit. And then drag this over to the MB Max 64 screen anywhere and drop it, and we saw nothing. Okay, the reason we saw nothing is because I already loaded those files. So we need to go new. Uh, okay, we need to go back to MB Max. 
Okay, that's the problem. I dropped it into high pack instead of the, uh, the editor. All right, let's try it again. And not. All right, new session. Third try should be the charm. There we go. Okay, so that's a real convenient way of getting your files into the editor. Just uh, use the Windows Explorer and drag and drop. I, I use that all the time, and I've seen other people using it, but I, ju I just don't know, you know how, how widely known that is, and that's one of the things that you can pick up from conferences is just watching people do things in a different way. And uh, so. so we're going to just... Uh, Continue loading the file. I'm going to or the files. I'm going to select all. Each one of these is a indiv individual survey line. So select all, and then we get into what we call the read parameters. And within here, there's uh, there's four tabs. There's a lot of information in here, and what you're doing is uh, telling the program how you want to process the survey. So some of it is, is pretty simple. Am I working in depth mode or elevation mode? Okay, so you just select whatever you're working in. Um, you can load side scan data to assist in editing with this checkbox. Um, this multi-detect is kind of a seldom used feature. And, and by the way, I'm not going to try and explain every single, you know, checkbox and button because that would, that would be tedious. And, uh, so I'm just going to skip over some of them, and you know, if if if, there, if I've skipped over one that's of great interest to you, then by all means, you know, raise your hand and let me know, and I'll make sure to stop. But there's there's a lot going on in here. So, um, okay, down here where it says matrix, this one is kind of important, and we'll click on the edit button here, and what that's going to do with the under the cells here is I'm going to break up the survey into three by three foot cells. And that's for, uh, we're going to save all the data, but we're also going to present it on three by three foot cells. We're going to run statistics on those. Uh, we do a lot of things based on the matrix. So uh, typically people have, you know, their choice of, you know, what they like to see for cell size, and you just enter that in here. You can also use a high pack matrix file if you want to. Um, well, one of the things you can do with the high pack matrix file is edit a subset of a survey. So you might have a, a very large area and you're only interested in a, a small area at the you know, present moment. So you might have a matrix file that covers that area. And yes? From one year, yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, because if, if the, the alternative to that is auto sizing to the data and the data is gonna change over the years. So we'll just stick with the three by three for now and okay that. Um, <clears throat> we've got a little section on TPU down here which um, normally isn't all that important but if you're gonna do the uh, cube processing uh, which some people do, you have to go through and set up these TPU parameters. So we'll do that after uh, the first pass through the program. Okay, so that's the survey tab. And then there's a corrections tab, and this is if you've got a tied file, you just click here and you load your tied file. Uh, in this case, I don't. It was using the RTK GPS for water levels. So we'll just cancel that. Uh, if you have a sound velocity file, you click here, and in this case, there's a few of them. So let's just uh, just to illustrate what we can do. Let's let's select all of these and open, and then what we get is this little grid here, and uh, uh, it it has the time of the cast, the time and date, but it doesn't have any position information. So uh, what we can do is interpolate between casts based on the uh, sounding time, uh, but we can't interpolate based on position because we don't have positions for the cast. If we did, we could enter them here, or they might be embedded in the file. 
So we'll just uh, select this time interpolation, and I'll show you later on, we'll see how that uh, comes into play. Okay. Devices, this one is pretty important, so we'll just uh, click on the edit button here. And these are all the devices that you use for the survey. So for navigation, we used um, the position information coming over from HIPAC survey. For, uh, this is an older survey, uh, like myself. Um, and this, in this case, the, uh, we're using a TSS uh, DMS-05 as the MRU. And the reason I kind of stress that it's, a, it's an older survey um, was, you know, back in the day, like, you know, 2000 to 2006, before Joe was hired, I used to spend a lot of time in the field. And, and when I go out in the field, I spend a lot of time with Danny Rogers and, and uh, Philadelphia District and, and others. So um, I'd bring back data sets from surveys, and I got to know these data sets really well. Um, and then, like, when Joe Burnett was hired and other people to pick up the field work, then, you know, I kind of stayed back in the office. But I still like the surveys that I brought back from the field because, you know, I, I knew what was going on and, and I just had a comfort level with it. So that's why some of the stuff you're looking at doesn't use the most modern uh, equipment. Um, for tides, we're using the uh, GPS data that's being passed over from HIPAC survey and um, we, what we call the RTK tides, where we're actually figuring out what the water level is and using it from the uh, GPS readings. Uh, this is an older uh, Resan CBAT 8125. Here's the offsets. So, like Joe was saying, you don't necessarily have to have all your offsets in before you survey. Uh, you can enter them in here, but probably most people prefer to, to have their offsets in when they survey for uh, the real-time QC. We'll okay that. Down here is the uh, patch test offsets. I'm sorry, Mike, yeah. Question the sure. Let me go back. Okay, right, yeah. Uh, the question is, what does this special cases button do? And I kind of skipped past that. So if you're in a situation where the uh, motion reference was installed in reverse, then you've got the option of uh, uh, inverting the pitch, inverting the roll. You can. Right. Um, yeah, the question is, what, what is our, our sense, positive up or positive down? So we know that heave comp we assume that heave compensators are sending us positive up, and then we change the sign of that and before we add it, and then it becomes a negative correction. Under normal circumstances, you leave this unchecked, yep. Uh, no, the only thing that you would do different in elevation mode is your water levels are positive upward. Everything else is the same. And it's just the way it is. That's the way Pat Sanders liked it. <laughs> okay, and so we're, we're getting to the end of this. Um, and there's the processing tab, and, and probably the, the trickiest of of anything we're gonna do in here is right in this little heave section because heave is, is, is such a, a difficult thing to get a handle on. So we can click on this and some of the options you have, uh, the simplest one is that you just use your GPS to be both water level and heave. So, you know, if you've got reliable GPS, it's always in the RTK fixed mode you can click this and, you know, your GPS is going to correct for both. Uh, the only downside to this is that typically your, your MRU is going to collect data at a higher rate than the GPS. This was true in the past, maybe more so than it is now. But anyway, that's an option that's available and it saved a lot of people. Say they get out and they do their surveys and the MRU went south 
and they didn't notice it or there was nothing they could do about it. And then they can correct their data just by using the, using the tides. Um, the second option is to use the MRU for heave. And uh, under that, there's this little business here of correct for induced heave. This doesn't have any effect whatsoever as long as um, your heave compensator is mounted at the boat center, at the CG. Uh, when it's mounted off to the side and you're using the old TMS, T, TSS uh, DMS-05 units, um, we might want to check that to uh, correct for the roll-induced heave or pitch-induced heave. Um, but that's all in the past. You, you guys aren't using those things anymore. You're using inertial systems. So bottom line is you, you never need to check this. And, you know, I spent a lot of time this summer working through some issues and, and really convinced myself that you never need to check this. Uh, remove heave drift. This is where maybe you come on line a little too quickly and your, your heave is kind of drifting up here and it does a you know, low period settling into what it should be. Uh, we've got another uh, graphical place to fix that, so I recommend you leave this unchecked. So these two stay unchecked. And then down here is the option to avoid double heave. And if you think about it, your, uh, your GPS antenna is moving up and down and your motion uh, MRU is moving up and down. So we gotta be careful that we don't double correct. And the two ways that we avoid that, one is to average the tide data and smooth that out and that removes the heave. And that worked that worked pretty good, I think, uh, especially when we were using multiple devices for this and, you know, we didn't know if the time tagging was quite right. We didn't have to worry about it when we were using this averaging method. But the better way of doing that is uh, merging tide data with heaves. So say if you're using a POS or an SBG or something like that and, and the, all the data is based on the same time reference, you know, you don't have any issues with time tags and this does a, a really good job of uh, avoiding the double correction. So I'm gonna select these options, okay. Last one is the uh, sonar processing. Uh, sonar ID here, this was before we actually had provisions for specifying which sonar you're using. This was the 8125, uh, you can Adjust the sound velocity profile every ping to reflect what you're seeing at the, uh, in the surface probe. Uh, apply grid convergence. This avoids the problems that you might have if you survey in different areas. Say if you go out to the, the western edge of a, a state plane and you do a calibration and you're going to get a, a yaw offset from that. And then you go to the eastern edge of the state plane, for example, and you do a calibration and you're gonna get a different yaw offset. And the reason is because the calibration is accounting for uh, both the mounting offset and the uh, grid convergence. So we have this option in here now, it came in the 2019, where you apply the grid convergence and then you don't have those issues before. It accounts for where it is in the, uh, in the state plane grid. The only tricky bit about this is you have to make sure that the calibration you're using doesn't include the convergence. In that case, you're gonna be double correcting for it. So what I would recommend if you wanna do this, okay, apply grid convergence, and then you know, uh, recalibrate for the yaw, you'll get a result which you should never have to change again. Uh, ray tracing line method is fast. It works good in shallow water. The arc method is slower but it's more accurate in deep water, by deep water meaning 1,000 meters, you know, like that. And then auto select just figures out which is most appropriate. Okay, so we're finally out through all this and we click okay. And you can see we've got a little progress bar down here. Okay. So we've loaded up the, the five files and um, 
Let's see, what's a, a good place to start would be, uh, this is the read parameters button. So in the past, after you loaded your files, you could never change anything in here. And now with the 64-bit program, you can change anything in here. So you don't have to reload your files, so, so that's a good thing. Um, as far as looking at the data, okay, so what we've got, we're obviously looking in map view, and here's the, uh, the track lines. So if you right click here and go to color settings, there's a number of things that you can do. Um, you can go black background or white background. Uh, the color by file, okay, so if I click on that, you can see the, the coloring by file went away and we just have, have gray survey lines. And then the color by GPS mode, what it does is, is tracks the mode code for you know, all of the uh, position points and it color codes based on that. So that's, that's great with the, with the NEMA modes that you know, most people are pretty familiar with that. With some of the other devices like the POSMV that have a lot more codes, I'm, I'm not sure how well it works, but it, it works great when you're working with the, with the NEMA modes. Got custom colors, if you've got, you know, if you have your own preference for colors, you can set them up in here. And then the, the rest of it down here, uh, soundings and matrix, this, this doesn't really apply right now because we're just looking at what we call stage one. And that's where we're just looking at the, the raw data. We're not concerned with depths yet. Now we'll close this. Okay, so you have limited color options um, when you're in the stage one. But this is, you can do a lot of useful editing in here. So uh, we're just gonna jump around a little bit and Okay, so we've got uh, these buttons over here, and these are, are individual editors. So, for example, if I click this one, this will show you the speed of the boat, and, um, and you can edit based on this. So a lot of times, it's, it's easier to see position errors by looking at, at uh, position changes or the speed than it is in, in looking at the, the data itself. Um, so, for example, if this, this is all clean, so I really wouldn't need to do any editing, but let's just say we wanted to, to remove this little bit at the end here. I could come over to this toolbox, and this has our edit tools, and there's a number of things we can, we can use. We can, uh, for example, we've got this line selection tool. So just, I click on that, I click on delete above, I get rid of fast delete, so I draw a line there, and I just click the delete button. So that's easy, and, and once you get used to this, you can edit manually really quick. Uh, if you ever make a mistake, we've got the, we've got the undo down here. So we'll click that and bring it back. And then we've got, for even faster editing, you can click on this, and then you see instead of a white line, we get this red line. And then as soon as the mouse button goes up, then, then the point is removed. So you can, you can really go through things uh, quickly using this. Now if you make a mistake, um, say for example, I thought I was, I wanted to delete above, but I had delete below so selected. And then, okay, oops, we've got the undo. And then the other thing you can do that's useful is if you see this red line and you immediately realize, oh, I made a mistake, I, I'm doing something I don't wanna do, you can hit the escape key and it just cancels it out. And then there's, there's a number of editing tools over here. They've got what we call the lasso where you just do like that. You've got the uh, rectangle where you do like that. You got the eraser and you just click. So there's a number of ways to, to edit the data manually. I'll just undo all that. And then 
I'm going to go back to something that I had meant to do when I first started up the program, but I forgot. Um, under this edit menu, there's uh, settings. And in the settings, there's this update mode. And this is, this is kind of a key thing where you have the automatic mode or you have the manual mode. So let's just select the manual mode. This might be appropriate if you've got a very large data set or you're working on a slow computer. Anything that causes the computer to be a little sluggish, you would want to select that. And then I'll come over here and above. Okay, and I removed it. Now you can see this, this little button over here turned red. So that's saying something's changed that, you know, needs to be recalculated. Instead of recalculating every time something changed, something has changed, it gives you the option to do a number of edits before recalculating. So I can do that. And, you know, I can edit as much as I want. I don't need to recalculate every time. But then when I'm ready, I just click on the button. And then, you know, now we're, now we're fully recalculated. If your computer is fast or you have a relatively small data set, which is, you know, this computer is fast and the data set is small, I'd select the auto and OK. And then if I do some deleting, the red light flashes on, but it automatically does the recalculations. So, so that's what that's all about. So I'm just doing a bunch of undos. There's uh, no limit to the level of undos. Uh, at one point, we had 1,000, and then one of our resellers said, OK, you know, I need more. 1,000 <laughs> won't do it. So if we do have a limit, we're not talking about it. <laughs> All right. So that's how you would uh, edit uh, positions based on speed. It's, it's really quite useful. Uh, the second one is a little editor is this heave slash tide editor. And once again, we're into the, the tricky vertical datum part of this stuff. And uh, you got the, uh, the check boxes up at the top, so I can, I can view the, the raw tide data. I can view the tide data after correction. I can view the raw heave data. I can view the heave data after correction. And you know, there's, there's a number of different options here. So um, let's just look at the, uh, the heave first. So we'll just turn off tide. And we'll just look at the, the, the heave raw data. And this all looks pretty good. You, 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 know, you can hardly ever edit heave data to make it right, you can, you can remove it, you can zero it, but you can't make it right after the fact. Um, so this is what we, what we would see. And this, this actually looks pretty good. Um, I mentioned before that we have an option. Let's just move this out here now. And this is tools, uh, heave adjustment, remove heave drift. And this can, you know, this can save you um, a lot of difficulties by paying attention to the heave drift. Um, you know, I, re I remember one case I was working on where there was a, uh, a dredging dispute that ran into millions of dollars. And what it was was that the uh, surveyors had neglected to remove the heave drift. So they were getting, you know, half a meter of heave at the beginning of the line. And then you multiply that out, and you know it turned out to be quite a bit. So we can we've got this adjustment, and just it's it's using a 12 second averaging period adjust. And then we go back here. Okay, and then zoom in. So you can see there's a slight difference here between the, the raw heave, which is in the, uh, in the uh, red, and the, uh, 
corrected heave, which has been adjusted in the blue. And then also, if you did something like true heave, uh, the uh, blue would show the true heave values and the red would show the real-time heave. And the, you know, the true heave is something that, you know, from what I've seen, I'm completely sold on it. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And that's the Aplanix version. Um, you know, SBG has it, uh, Coda Octopus, pretty much everyone has this delayed heave processing, which is a, quite an improvement. Yeah. Uh, question is, if you re if you use true heave, do you need to apply remove heave drift? And the answer would be no. The the true heave is going to be good. Okay. Um, it's it's better to to show it graphically, but um, yeah. What what it is is that. Um, you know, if the, if the boat undergoes unexpected accelerations, like, you know, turning around to come on the next line and there are changes in speed, what can happen is the, the heave compensator gets a little bit confused and it'll, it'll drift either above or below the, uh, the, the zero plane where it should be. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, you know, I've heard manufacturers claim that, oh, no, that doesn't happen anymore, but, you know, I don't know. I, I still see it. So what was the problem? When you turn to go on the next line, mm -hmm. but you hit the end line, but you stop there, and then you go on and start a new line. Right. Know? Yeah, that would be the, that, that would be the case in, in ending one line and then coming around and starting the next line where this would happen. Uh, the solution for it is just more run-in time to start the next line. So maybe instead of giving yourself 50 feet run-in before starting the line, 150 feet. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the uh, that's the heave. So if we want to look at the uh, the tide data, and remember this is using the GPS for, um, for measuring water levels. And you can see what, what we're showing here is the, uh, is the raw data. And we've got it, remember the color coding was based on GPS mode. And it gives the codes up here. So the NEMA code for um, fixed RTK is four, which is what you want. And you can see we're, you know, color-wise, we're all good here. This, these five were, lines were all run with, uh, in the, the fixed uh, RTK mode. So that's the raw data. And then under the correction that we actually use, and then, let's see. See this, it's easier to get rid of this. Okay, so you can see that there's a, a, a slight difference between the raw data, which is in green here, and the actual uh, correction that we're gonna apply, which is in yellow. And now they're kind of overlaying one another because you know the MRU, everything is, is mounted at a center point. But if you're using a system where you have the, uh, uh, everything on the pole off to the side of the boat, uh, you might see significant differences in here that are accounting for the lever arm of the, uh, of the GPS. So once again, this is, is probably some of the most difficult things you'll have to deal with, and I know it's really the most difficult thing that I have to deal with in here. And even this, this has been in here for, you know, the program is 10 years old, and. You know, we still found a, uh, a bug last summer. Um, someone was using it in such a way that we didn't expect, and we had to, we had to do a fix for it. Okay, so uh, positions are good. Uh, heave and tide are good. This one shows uh, heave, pitch, roll, and heading. Once again, there's not much you can do to edit these things. You're mainly just looking to see if... Uh, you know, it looks reasonable. 
based on what you know of the survey conditions. This uh, heading graph is just kind of all over the place because it goes from uh, zero down at the bottom to 360 and, you know, like that. So it's, you know, heading uh, north-south. Last one is uh, sound velocity. And we've got two things here. Um, see, over on the, the right-hand side, I, I mentioned before that we've got the, uh, since I selected multiple uh, sound velocity profiles, it has an interpolation option uh, between the profiles. So you can see the red, it's labeled up here. Uh, this was the one collected at 1210. The green was collected at, at uh, 1230. And then this is the interpolated profile, the white. And you can see as we move around in here that the interpolation actually changes. How is it interpreted? Yeah, pretty much all of the above as far as methods of interpolation and uh, that, that's a, a really good question. I'll go back to the read parameters here. And then under corrections, uh, velocity file. So I don't know how easy this is to read, but here's the interpolation method. We have no interpolation. We have interpolation based on time and then time and position. So no interpolation means it just uses the uh, uh, you, you know, you, you do a cast and from that point on, it's going to use that one until the next cast. Uh, time, it's going to actually do interpolation uh, between the cast times using the sounding time. And then uh, time and position, uh, we can't do that here because we don't have the position of the, of the uh, cast and that one gets a little more intricate. So we'll go back to time. Thanks, that's a, that's a good question. And um, okay, so over on the left side here, we can, what we're looking at is the sound speed at the sonar head. And you can see that's you know pretty constant and then a, it blips up and then it blips up again. I don't know if this is you know bubbles or, or what it what you know what the cause of this is, but uh, we can use these editing tools. Uh, we'll select the line above. And so it's just super easy to, to remove those things. Um, so, okay, so that, that's pretty much the stage one of editing. And then the next thing we do is, is we're gonna be concerning ourselves with the depths again. So we've got this button here, which is uh, stage two depth editing. And you click that. And it goes off and does all the calculations. And, um, and uh, and we've got depths. So what we're looking at in this view is, uh, this is the matrix actually, where uh, we got our three by three cells. And if we just mouse wheel in, we get in far enough, okay, now you can you can see the cells. Um, but we're not looking at individual soundings in here. And then, that is the Mississippi River, yeah. It's uh, a marine terminal down in New Orleans. Can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's an interesting data set because of all the stuff that's sunk outside of the terminal. So, um, okay, so this is a matrix view. We can select a lot of different things. We can look at the median depth, look at average, minimum, maximum, center point, you know, lots of different things. And uh, what we can see is that this, this doesn't look very good. This, this looks pretty bad. Um, so uh, you, you, should, you shouldn't see this if you've got a good survey. And what it is, is uh, if we go back in here, the read parameters and the corrections, 
is that these these are just made up files that don't really apply to this uh, this data, um, and you know I just use them for illustration purposes. So if we just hit the X button here to remove those, and OK. <clears throat> now it's starting to, to look as it, as it should. Yep. Uh, so st starting again with, with the way that we can look at the data, let's just look at colors, because um, um, OK, so we get uh, Just trying to think of the best way of, of illustrating this, um, because the matrix is is limited. Um, it, it can be a little bit confusing because this is how we color code soundings, but we're not actually looking at soundings here. We're looking at at matrix cells, and um, so let's just for the the sake of demonstration, let's just bring up one of these windows. Uh, this is this was uh, how we originally um, presented all the data was in this sweep window. It's just one one line at a time, looking at uh, in this case 150 different pings, um, and it's you know it's it's kind of a nice way of looking at it. You can uh, you can go profile mode, you can go map view, but. Uh, main thing I wanted to show is some of the colors you have. So we'll go into color settings again. And then the, the first one is color by depth. And everyone kind of understands that. Uh, you can also either auto scale the uh, vertical range or you can manually scale it. So here it's uh, from 30 to 40. And we go back to the auto scale. And it's from 18 to 138. We can also color soundings by sonar head. In this case, it's a single head system, so you know it's all going to come up in red. Uh, port and starboard soundings, uh, TVU and THU. We can talk about with the cube. You can color by beam angle, and this one's kind of nice. It um, it uses three different colors, and uh, the green is all the soundings. Um, less than or equal to 45 degrees. So this is, you know, kind of considered the, the very safe zone. And then the yellow is soundings between 45 degrees out to 60 degrees. And this is the, okay, you know, be careful with these. And then anything beyond 60 degrees shows up in red. So, uh, beam number, yeah, that one's not useful for multi-beam. It's good for multiple transducer. And then some of, the, uh, some of the crazier ones, like you can color code based on tide. So, okay, why would you ever want to color code your soundings based on tide? It might be useful in trying to figure out bus in your data. And then we've got a, a whole bunch of things like that. We can color code based on heave, pitch angle, roll angle, and so on and so forth. Okay. So um, let's see. We went over the, um, the little editors that are on this side. And then there's a, a, a whole other set of them that are on this side. And, and these are for working with the depths. And so I showed you this, uh, this sweep editor. And that all looks pretty clean. We'll just. Trying to find some areas where it would be useful to do some editing in here. Let's look at dots. OK, so here's an example. What this is is we're uh, sounding over by the bank, and some of the older uh, systems had trouble with uh, multiple reflections. So this is actually you know down, back, down, back again, uh, all this noise that you see down here. So the editing tools that I showed you before, we got the line editor. Let's go below, fast edit. So these all work in here too. So this is uh, 
this, this can be a useful way to edit the data manually. Uh, the downside of this is you can't compare adjacent lines, so you're only look, looking at one line at a time. And, uh, uh, you know, in most cases you want to look at. But uh, it's, it's good for cleaning up these obvious things. And just, you know, for example, um, we've, got, we've got this here. And um, I think pretty much every, every filter we have in this program, automatic filter, is going to say, I'm going to take that out. That's, you know, that, that, that's not there. That's, that's not real. But what it is is like uh, an anchor chain. So it is real. And even though the, so that's where you got to be careful with the automatic editing is that, you know, sometimes it'll take out things that you want to leave in. Okay, so that's the sweep window. Um, we actually have uh, a second one, which we, is the single sweep window. And that's if you really want to dive down into your data. This just shows a, a single sweep or ping at a time. Um, it's available. I don't know how useful it is, but um, one of the things you can do in here is click on this and show ray tracing. And so what this is supposed to do is actually show the way that the sound bends through water. Um, but unfortunately, at the scales we work in, usually it's not visible in here. But I know uh, Stroud did a nice job explaining the refraction and issues that you can come up with um, in his presentation this morning. Okay. And if there's questions, feel free to chime in. We have a second sweep window, so these, these work in tandem if that's useful to you. And then we have, um, let's see, more windows. Let's just look at this imagery window. So way back at the, the very beginning, there was the checkbox that said to load the side scan data if it's available. And uh, because it takes up, you know, significant space, we don't, you know, sometimes you don't want to load it. But, uh, but it, it, it can be quite useful. So for example, if I'm looking at the bathymetry and I click here, I go over to the site scan, and it shows the vicinity of, of where I clicked. And, you know, these are, these are cases of, you know, very, very obvious uh, features on the bottom. So if we click on that, you know, it shows up over here. But in a lot of cases, it's not nearly this obvious, and that's when that becomes handy. So you can show side scan it's available, or you can show this uh, beam average backscatter. This usually isn't as good as the side scan, but. <clears throat> uh, more windows, the water column, if you're, uh, you know, if you're collecting that, you can look at that here. Oh, it shows up at the darndest times. <laughs> um, okay, so the profile window, what, what this is, let's just zoom out here a little bit. So we've gridded this, uh, this survey into, uh, into a matrix, and you can see these, uh, these crosshairs here. So what the, the white is, is that's the, what we call the current profile. And if we click on the profile window, that's what you're actually looking at. So this is this. And if we zoom in, okay, so in the profile window, uh, right now we've got it set up so that we're just color coding based on depth, but it's, it's usually nice to look at uh, color coding by file in here. And then you can see how one line compares to the next. You can see how your overlap is. You know, you can see a lot of things just by this, this simple color coding. So if I wanted to, uh, I've got this bar over here. I can slide this down to the bottom. And you can see this line goes to the, the, the beginning of the matrix. So one way of editing the, 
the data, let's just get back to default here. Okay, so one way of editing the data is just stepping through these profiles. And, you know, this is unusual data. We, you know, we've got all the sunken barges and stuff over there. So, you know, this isn't typically what you'd see. Um, but if we scroll up far enough, then we'll start seeing the channel also. But up at the top here, you can see that we're showing section 19 out of 601. So if you're going to edit your data this way, say, let's say I wanted to remove that point right there. If you're going to edit your data this way, it's going to take a long time, and it's going to be very tedious. So, um, but what you can do is use this, this uh, stacking feature, we call. So in this case, we increase that, and now we're looking at uh, two matrix cells. So it's uh, uh, a six-foot uh, cross-section, and then three, so it's nine-foot. And you can just increasing that up, increase that up until, you know, in, until it appears that it's, it's, you know, past the point of usefulness. So we're set at 11 right now, and we'll just start scrolling up. Okay, now, now we're starting to see where we have the, uh, the overlapping data. And we can see normally anything that shows up underneath, you know, the defined uh, riverbed is, is noise and, you know, can be safely removed. But now we're at section four out of 55, so this is now looking a little bit more manageable, that we can, you know, maybe we can get through this data uh, fairly quickly. So just, just stepping through the profiles like this, looking at the overlap, uh, you know, I, I think this is a good, cautious way of, of, of uh, editing your data. And you're looking at everything, you know, it's conservative, you're not taking any chances with uh, automatic filters. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one, it's, it's something that's available to you in the program. So I just had a mistake and deleted above when I wanted to, and so this undo is always here. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to rotate the white line? You mean? I'm sorry. You mean take the cross sections like this? Oh, right, right. Yeah, that that. There is a way of doing that, but not through this, this profile editing, and I'll, I'll show you that. Right. Sure. Right. Okay, well, um, Let's just, we can just close out of here for now. And uh, what you could use for that is this, uh, we just call it the uh, AB cross-section tool, and it's the same thing that you use for the patch test. So we, if we click on that, then we can just, you know, drag our cross-section any orientation we want. And then, right, and let's see, let's, so there's the A and the B. And as we move through it, let's put some stacking on this. Well, it, it's whatever orientation you want. So in this case, you know, we, we don't have any concerns. It's a rectangular survey. But if we did have, like what you were talking about with meanders, then you just use this as, as long as it's useful, and then you, you cut a different one, you know, when you, when you go through a turn. So it, it, it's not ideal, but it is a, a, a way of doing that where, you know, we've talked about uh, various improvements. Um, one of them would be uh, having the cross-section perpendicular to a centerline file, and then, you, you know, you wouldn't have to do these manual 
sections. Okay, so uh, one more thing in the profile view, what we're looking at is the, the beams here, but we have a, a checkbox for matrix points. So if we click on that thing, then now it, we, we kind of get a different view of the data where um, we've got, you know, we've got obviously bad soundings down here, but when I'm working with my three by three grid, it doesn't affect that at all. So uh, one of the things that I've seen people have trouble with in editing multi-beam data is that they tend to over-edit it and you know, make it look good and, and just right. And the, the best way I've, I've heard it described to avoid that is you're not creating a Picasso here, right? You know, you're, you're cleaning data, so. So yeah, so so this is is useful, and you can okay. Here's a, a case where um, the data is actually affected by some uh, some rogue points. So there, it would be appropriate to uh, to edit them. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. But but. You know, given the density of good soundings versus the few rogue soundings, the average is still, you know. But it doesn't need to be average. Uh, it could be, let's say, pick the median. And here's what we get when we're looking at median soundings. Of course, if we're looking at, uh, you have the option of minimum, and then you can see the, the white line just traces the, the top of the soundings. Correct. And the points themselves don't need to be edited, they're not affected. Right, that's, that's you know, discretion that, that you might use. Just, just keeping in mind that these points here aren't affecting the, the final product at all. You know, you may want to edit them anyway, but maybe you don't have to, maybe you're in a hurry to get this one out, so, you know, I'm just not. Yeah, oh yeah, yep. So that, that might be a time saver. And, you know, the stacking is, is great. Wait, what? And, you know, what does it happen if you have, say, a flat seabed and a marble wall, for example, and you, you know, you've got your matrix, three by three matrix above the wall, for example, it's going to average the points from the seabed to the top of the wall. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean that's a good point. How do we deal with with vertical structures? And and we're you know we're we're hydrographic software. We don't have great solutions for that. We've got a. Um, right. Right. Right, right. But you're in control of it here because you're actually doing it manually and you're looking at what you're doing. So, you know, and that, that kind of leads to the, the second part of it uh, that we have a, a number of automatic ways of cleaning the data, and those are the filters. So we have some, some basic filters, uh, you know, corrected depth, that's an easy one. Um, the speed over ground uh, filter could be used in the stage one editing that we were doing before. Uh, beam angle limits, that's, you know, very useful to apply filters based on that. And uh, horizontal offset and uh, uh, range filters. And then the GPS filters, these are ones that you could have, that we could have applied back in the stage one editing. For example, uh, RTK tides say that we only wanted to accept uh, GPS mode four, then we could set this and then come over here and filter all the files. 
and then that's that's for uh, that's for the uh, vertical, and the, this is for the horizontal. Um, number of filters in here. Um, there's you know, there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get too bogged down. Let's just go over here to the, uh, the matrix filter. So, so what this is doing, <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When we go to these sweep filters, these, these, this is where we're only looking at one survey line at a time. So you're not taking into account the overlap between lines and you're filtering. And therefore, they're you know, kind of of limited value. Whereas when we get into these matrix filters, then it is looking at the overlap. So, um, so the way this works, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I just make a selection. Uh, in this case, I want to select the cell median, and I want to able I want to enable a filter above the median, and let's go four feet, and then I want to enable a filter below the median, and let's go four feet again. And uh, come back here, and there's, there is something that I <coughs> excuse me neglected to, to talk about before, and that's the filter preview. So this is a good time to show you that. It's just a little checkbox over here, and when we click on that, it shows uh, these yellow X's over every point that's outside the filter limit. So the way to look at that is that um, everywhere there's an X, there's going to be a point deleted, and uh, it looks like it's it's all over in the area where the uh, where the wrecks are. There's nothing out in the channel. Well, a couple points that are going to get removed, but uh, so anyway, this filter preview can be can be quite useful. Um, this is a lot of people like this kind of as a, a, a quick and dirty product where they just, you know, they just want to click one button and do some preliminary cleaning. For example, this might be very appropriate in the auto processing where you set up this, uh, this matrix filter and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll do a good preliminary cleaning on your data. Okay, so. Once we've set up the filters, then you just click either all files, or if you only want to do a couple files, say, let's select these three, and I want to do the selected files. So let's just do that. Okay, so it only removed, this right here shows the number of points removed and the uh, percentage of the total. So it only took out 17 points, which is, uh, um, you know, 0.0 percent of the total. Um, I think I'm going to reload the files real quickly because I think I might have applied filters when I didn't really intend to. Okay, so this is, this is more, more like it. This is what I was expecting. So you see a lot of yellow X's, and uh, if we click, if we go into the filter options, and then we click, uh, let's filter all files, it actually took out 25,000 points, which is 1.7% of the total. But it did a nice job of cleaning it up. Okay, yep. Yeah, Joe's uh, suggestion was show where the total number of points loaded is. So we can uh, get out of here. And this uh, question mark is a little report option. So we click on that. And okay, so here's the, the sounding count. There's one and a half million soundings, uh, number of heat pitch and roll readings, 35,000. And this is, you know, this is a small survey, of course, uh, just for <clears throat> demonstration purposes. And then there's a, a fair amount of, of information that's available over here, the uh, 
depth limits of the uh, survey area, uh, what the matrix looks like, um, <clears throat> some timing information. So it did the uh, beam calculations in a little over a second. <clears throat> So let's see what we've, we sh I showed the, uh, <clears throat> this cross-section tool. The other one that's really useful is this, uh, what we call the cloud pop-up. So you go in here, just click on the button, and then you drag a box, and then it shows all the soundings that uh, fall within that box. And the uh, color code by file is kind of getting in our way here, so we'll uh, turn that off. So this is this is a small cloud view. You can you know you can rotate it, you can pan and tilt, and the thing is that it shows all the soundings, uh, not just the matrix view. So if you find something that's particularly interesting in here, you can right click, and then save X Y Z. So that just saved out this little X Y Z section. So that's useful when you're, you know, hunting for targets. I think that was used a lot in the um, the Normandy survey when they were locating tanks and things like that. Okay. So um, so we're say we're done with the editing here. And then we uh, next thing we want to do is, is save things. So um, under File and uh, Save Survey or the little disk icon here, click that. And once again, you have quite a few options. Uh, this HS2X is is the preferred format. You always want to save to that because that saves everything. If you ever need to re-edit, you can you know you can do that. So we'll just save all to the to this format, all the files. And then by way of explanation, this uh, HS2 format is, is older. It's kind of obsoleted or uh, deprecated. It's something that's available uh, if people need it, but uh, you know we don't recommend that, that people use that. There's everything you can do in here can be done better in this HS2X format. Uh, XYZ points, you can either save all the points with this, or you can save one point per cell. If you're going one point per cell, then down here are the selections. And then some other options over here. Uh, one thing that I, I meant to, to show you, but because I misplaced my notes, I forgot. Um, but th this is something that I find, you know, very, very useful. And let's get rid of the filter preview for now. And uh, let's see. Let's come up here. And you can either select the, uh, the vertical range, the Z range, or the sigma standard devi deviation. So if we do that, then you, you get quite a different view of the, of the survey. And it looks like what we're seeing are, are some sand waves in here. And as we scroll through this, we're, we're kind of looking for anomalies. And since, since we did a, a thorough cleaning with that matrix filter, we're not seeing too many of them. But let's say, for example, OK, we're seeing something down here. Let's just do that cloud pop-up pop on that. And what exactly are we looking at here? Okay, so it looks like that's something that's real. You know, that's, that's a, a real feature and it's not uh, noise in the data. And then you can just kind of scan through things kind of quickly uh, when you've got this mode selected. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this. Now you also have the option, in, if we go back in the filters, search only, and then we can say, okay, I want to locate every cell with the vertical range above, say, five feet. And then let's search all files. 
Usually you'd have multiple monitors. But here it located a point and we can actually, under more windows, I didn't talk about the cell window, but this, this dives deeper into the data and it looks at the individual cells. Uh, you can include neighboring cells and then you get a different, you know, slightly different view of the data. Um, but what I, what I wanted to show you is that, um, you know, this looking at the vertical range of the cells and the standard deviation can be, you know, uh, quite a useful tool in, in editing. This search is not going to, you know, be too useful in this case. Uh, particularly because we've got all the recs over here. So it would be more useful if you're just looking at a, a, a flat, you know, dredge channel or whatever. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we, we've saved this survey. We can, uh, we can if, we, if we ever need to go back to it, let's just, let's just exit out of here. And then we can start up the program again. And in this case, we want to go to the edit folder. And we've got these HS2X files, select them all. So we're exactly back where we started from. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next part of it is the TPU and Q. With any questions on the basic editing stuff, uh, be happy to to stop, and of course, I'll stick around afterwards if there's anything that comes up. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, Rob, do you know if, it, if any of the presentations have talked about TPU yet? No, okay, all right. So we've got something in HIPAC called uh, TPU. It's Total Propagated Uncertainty. It's it's not something that we invented, it, was, uh, it came out of academia. And the idea behind it is to look at all the potential errors of your survey devices and to come up with the estimated error of your, uh, of your soundings, of your survey. So how that plays into uh, to this program, if we go into the read parameters, if we wanna do Q, which is the uh, uh, combined uh, bathymetric estimator, uh, it requires the TPU parameters to be set up. So in the, the read parameters here, we go over to calculate TPU, we <coughs> click on that, and then there's a number of accuracy standards that you can select from. There's uh, USACE hard and soft, uh, a couple different IHO orders, and uh, so let's just call this uh, USACE soft. And then um, we click here, which is the TPU editor. Now we're gonna bring that one up. And I don't, I don't know how many people have been in here, but it's, uh, it's, it's qu it can get quite involved. And because it came out of academia, some of the descriptions of the fields are, you know, things that are, are you know, not understandable by you know, myself, of course, and, and, and many other people. But you can do some, uh, some estimating in here. So the way I like to do this is under the file menu, you can, um, restore, restore the default values. And so that's best, best guess, uh, estimates. And then under positioning system, if you're working with RTK, you can select this generic RTK. Generic DP, if you're working with DGPS, you can select this. And then there's uh, various other systems here which are actually spelled out. So let's just say this is, we'll just call this generic RTK. Uh, MRU system, we were actually working with, um, Oh, we don't, ha uh, there we go, uh, DMSO5, <coughs> didn't like that, how about this one, nope, okay, moving on, uh, multi-beam systems, uh, this, this was the uh, uh, CBAT 8125, like that, okay, I'm not sure where we're going here. 
this does happen to be the uh, the 2020 beta version, so you know I've got a little bit of an out here, but I'll try and figure out why why this is happening uh, before the release, of course. And then you can select heading systems here, and what that does is it fills out all this first page of uh, parameters. And when we go to the environment, um, there's another page of parameters, and you know, some of these get fairly esoteric. Uh, speed of sound at the surface, okay, that's pretty good. Peak to peak swell, not even sure what that is. Uh, FA, seafloor slope, you know, not a clue. Hey, thank you, Joe. Joe has done a lot. He's done more work in figuring this out, and he's also learned the tricks to gaming the system. So. You can talk to oh, Joe if <laughs> somebody, okay, yes. Is that, um, so speed of sound is in meters per second. Is yes. It, is the depth of the SD profile also in meters? Uh, yeah, I think everything in here is, is in meters. This is, you know, a academic stuff, and, and they worked in meters, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do spell it out. Um, you know, okay, Joe, spatio-temporal variation. were taken okay so this is yeah Joe was saying this is based on the location and time where the sound velocity casts were taken so <laughs> what's that At the surface, right? I mean, well, you know, really average, uh, yeah, right. So that, you know, I, I think the well, takeaway is... I was at the Canadian Hydrographic Conference and, and cornered Rob Hare about this, and his answer was, ask Jonathan Bowden. So, <laughs> okay, and Rob Hare wrote well, it, well, right, well, yeah. 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 So I, I think the point is not to get to get hung up on anything in here and start with default values and then do the best you can beyond that. And, you know, that's all you can do, really. Um, sensor info, we've got physical offsets in here. We've, we've filled these out from our, uh, from our INI files. And then, you know, a, a whole other set of values. So what I did was I set the default values. We changed things based on our positioning system, MRU, and that. So I'm going to say good enough, and I'm going to um, save this and then make current so it's actually used in the editing session. And then we can get out. So now that we've edited, we'll just reload and then... Okay. So some of the windows we have in here, say for example, let's look at this one and let's do the color coding uh, based on total vertical uncertainty, TVU. And then this, this checkbox, it says compare TVU and THU to survey accuracy standards. So remember, I selected the you say soft standard, and the program says all green to go. Everything, everything's good. You're, you're passing that. If we look at the horizontal uncertainty, again, it's green. And so, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but... The, the TPU is, is required if you want to do cube. And then maybe for cube, if we've got time, let's just go back to the uh, presentation. So we do got a little section on cube at the end. 
So it's just a, a, an introduction. So it's, uh, it came out of the University of New Hampshire 15 years or so ago, uh, combined uncertainty and bathymetric estimator. So this estimator here is kind of telling is that this isn't actual soundings, this is a model, this is a depth estimate. Uh, the original intention was to speed up the processing of the multi-beam data. So it's got a lot of, of high-level statistics in there. Um, you know, if you're interested, a cube node is what we call a matrix cell. So it's just some, you know, a point within a three by three uh, cell that we've selected. A hypothesis is just, you know, uh, a possible depth estimate at a node in, in cube terminology. And it's what the statistics have calculated is that this would be a reasonable depth, you know, and so on. So if you're interested, you can, you know, you can go in here. There's also uh, papers on the internet. If you search cube, if you want to, you know, really under, understand better what's going on with this, which is way beyond the scope of, of what we're doing here, uh, you can do a, a Google search on cube papers. So we've got the button here where we want to calculate cube. Use cube, okay, that's what we wanted. Now here's the option to exclude soundings outside of the TPU limit. We saw everything was inside, so you know, this is safe to do. Uh, and then, you know, an auto calculate option. And then there's these expert settings. If you click on this, and these are a number of uh, tuning parameters you can use in Cube. And uh, the, you know, what these parameters do can be found in the papers that you can find on the internet. And you know, don't ask me because <laughs> probably outside the realm of any, you know, what anyone at HIPEC knows. So we go ahead and calculate Cube. Okay. So here's our, our depth surface, and you can see what we're looking at now is cube depth. And then there's another uh, useful parameter with cube, and, and one of the most valuable things about it actually is uh, this uncertainty, uh, cube uncertainty. So what it'll do is calculate an uncertainty for each of these points, and then you can combine that. So you have a depth and you have an uncertainty, and a lot of people see that to be a you know, very valuable thing. Um, it, it is good, um, it's just, you know, kind of a commitment to, uh, to learn. Um, okay, so I think that's good, and we have a reception in five minutes, so I don't want to hold you. Uh, I'll stick around afterwards if anyone has any questions, but thank you for, uh, for coming and listening, and appreciate it. Is it great?